I, I will give a lecture on the large deviation uh, theory and um, application to the dynamics of uh, turbulent jets. So the, the application are, are basically uh, in the same framework as the, the one that was uh, discussed by uh, Bill Young last week. It's uh, the, the barotropic model. And so this will be the, the second part of the lecture. But uh, before to, to go towards this, I want to give you some uh, general uh, information about uh, large deviation theory and uh, how they can be applied in uh, uh, statistical physics and complex dynamical systems. So I will try to, to motivate the use of large deviation theory in, in turbulence in general, uh, and but I will specifically insist on the application on, on geophysical uh, fluid uh, dynamics. So I, I begin with a, <coughs> uh, a, sh a short introduction and part of the introduction you, you have already seen uh, it before. So I mean large deviation theory is something that uh, which aim is to, to compute uh, the probability of event in asymptotic limits and it is often related to rare events. So there are different cases in turbulent flow wet where rare events may be important. So there are mainly two families of example. So one family of example where rare events are important is when the these events have a huge impact. And so uh, during the first week I have taken the example of heat wave or extreme heat waves. And so the, the question then was to compute the probability of extreme heat waves and how to uh, obtain numerical tools and theoretical tools specifically dedicated to the computation of extreme heat wave. So another example is when ver ver there is a, a bistability situation. So a bistability situation is a situation for which the system has two very different attractors and then the uh, so that's why it is called bistable or multistable. It, it is the notion that you have two stable attractors and then the systems will switch from one attractor to another and when there is a time scale separation between the time you need to switch from one attractor to another, I mean the duration of the switch and the time you need to wait in between two events, then we, we 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 call this uh, multi-stability situation. So there are there are hundreds of examples like that in turbulent flows, and uh, some of them in in, in geophysical fluid dynamics. So a possible example, uh, although it is not well understood and not well studied yet, is the the bistability of a Kuroshio current. So you you know that the Kuroshio is the counterpart of uh, the Gulf Stream in in the Pacific Ocean. So this is an old picture uh, from Taft. Um, I mean, the, the picture, these two pictures come from uh, this paper. So where you see the, the path of the Kuroshio during the period, during uh, several different periods. Here you have 1956, 1959, 1963, 1964. And so you see that the, the path goes along the coast of uh, Japan here. And during the period 1959-1962, the path is, is uh, follow a different route, so it it, it makes a, a big meander uh, away from the, the coast of uh, Japan. And so it is. Um, I mean, this phenomena has been uh, not well observed b because of uh, the, the time scale involved are decadal time scale, and it is uh, hardly seen in. Uh, in comprehensive uh, GCM, so uh, it, it is a, a process which seems to be very inertial and one would need to have an extremely high res resolution in, in good uh, ocean model. So a similar example was shown uh, yesterday by uh, Thierry where he, we, we were looking at uh, the Gulf of Mexico and then we, we were seeing two very different paths for the, the current uh, in the Gulf of uh, Mexico. And so th there are actually uh, hundreds of examples in, in, ex in experiments in turbulent flow, in, in, in laboratory experiments of such bistability situation. And another one which is related to geophysical fluid dynamics is this experiment that has been done in the group of 
Harry Sweeney and uh, Michael with some ID by uh, Michael Gill. So here it's a rotating tank experiment. So you have a tank which is about uh, uh, with a diameter of about one meter. So it rotates fast such that the flow is dominated by the, the, the Coriolis force. I mean the uh, geostrophic balance. And so the, the flow is nearly two dimensional. There are small three dimensional effects. And so you can see uh, uh, here a gray area, which is a, a, a bottom topography, which is added to the flow. And so this has been designed in order to, to mimic, I mean, mid latitude uh, atmosphere dynamics. All four the, the, the parameter uh, regime are quite different from the one of the actual atmosphere. And so you what you can see are the, quasi the, the streamlines for this quasi two dimensional flow. And so you can see two patterns here. One pattern that is much affected by the topography and which has been called blocked by analogy with block states in, a, in the atmosphere. And one pattern which is not much affected by the topography that has been called uh, zonal. And so when we when they, they take the, the, they measure the velocity at that point here as a function of time, then you observe that uh, the velocity, uh, you observe first that there are indeed very different states, the zonal state and the block state. And then from time to time, you have switches from the zonal state to the, the block state. And the typical time you need the duration of the switch is very fast compared to the, the typo typical time you remain in one of these states. So this is by contrast with what's happening in the uh, Earth atmosphere for which you don't really have this time scale separation. But here in these experiments, you have this time scale separation. So this is an example of a, a bistability situation. So what is rare then, what is rare is actually the transition from one state to another. So in climate, we may imagine that this this could happen. And so the key point here is that the time you need to wait to see a switch from one attractor to another is usually huge. And it, it, it's usually much longer than uh, uh, what people use to compute numerically. So if, this, if, if such a possibility may happen with your climate model, Probably you don't know because you, you have not looked for that. So let me show you uh, another example here with uh, Jupiter's, Jupiter's zonal jet. So I, I, I have already told this briefly during the, the my talk uh, uh, three weeks ago. So you, as you maybe probably you remember that Jupiter's jet are very stable. This is illustrated by the comparison here of the data from Voyager and from Cassini. And so you see that uh, the two curves uh, nearly overlap. But what I mean, what, hap what happened in the period 1939-1940 is that uh, uh, observers have seen the appearance of uh, these three white ovals that appears after the instability of, of one of these jets. So on Jupiter at that time, the, the overall structure of a jet stand, I mean one of the jet uh, suddenly disappeared. So this is another example of a, a, a very rare transition from one attractor to, to, to another. And so this is the example I, I will try to describe using the, uh, a barotropic model in the, the second part of uh, the lecture. So let me skip this one. So I will show you an example from a, a very different field, which is also related to geophysical application. So uh, this, this is this are random transition or bistability in uh, MHD problem. So here we, we are looking at the, the magnetic field reversal in a, in an experiment of uh, uh, of a rotating uh, uh, of a metal liquids, which is uh, forced by uh, uh, propeller and it was it, it is a, a turbulent flow that uh, produce a self-sustained dynamo so this uh, this experiment is very famous because it was the 
the first self-sustained dynamo in a laboratory. So another example of a, 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 a self-sustained dynamo is uh, the production of a magnetic field by the, the motion of the turbulence in, in the earth core. So it produces the earth magnetic field. And probably you know that over geological time scale, the polarity of the magnetic field of the earth change. And so this happens over time scale, which are uh, uh, huge compared to the typical time scale of the turbulent flow. And so this is another example in geophysics where you have very rare transition from one attractor to another. In that case, the, the, the transition is from the flow with a po uh, polarity towards north to a flow with a polarity towards south. So in this experiment, we, uh, we have uh, an analogous uh, phenomena for, for some regime of experiments. And so here you can uh, see the magnetic field. There are several probes. So we can see the probes, which uh, the, the red probe or the green probe. And uh, this is as a function of time. So if you look at the red probe, so you see that uh, we have a, a magnetic field towards north for a time, then it switched towards south, then it switched towards north, and so on and so forth. And the transitions are very rare in the sense I was describing before. I mean, if you look at the duration of the transition, it is extremely fast compared to the time you have to wait in between uh, two transitions. And so what uh, uh, our colleagues have done here is to, to plot uh, the, the time for the uh, different polarity. And, and so, the, so this the, the reason why I show this uh, picture is because of this analysis of uh, this transition but, uh, that has been done by, uh, by our colleague in uh, ENS Paris, in, in the group of uh, Stéphane Fauve. This curve has been done by uh, François Petrelis. So what he has done is to put on top of, of, uh, of each other 80 of the transition from the north polarity to the south polarity. So here you have uh, the, the north polarity states, here you have the south polarity states, and here you can see 80 transition. And so uh, as you can see, the transition, the transition dynamics nearly overlap. So you see that the, the, they have a distinctive dynamical feature. Here you have the shoulder and here an overshoot. And so all the transition occur the same way. So it's kind of striking because when you ask what is the, how long should you wait to see such a transition, then you expect to see a, a random process, something like a Poisson process. So it's just like uh, the, the radioactive decay of uh, uh, as, you have as you have learned in undergraduate, because it the system has to wait so long in between two transitions that it completely loses the memory of its initial condition. Then, because of this loss of memory, the time you need to wait before the next transition is independent from what happened before. And then if you work out the consequences of this, you find that the, the transition, the, the PDF of the transition time sh should be exponential, and it, it, it should be something like a Poisson process. So when the transition occurs, it's completely random. But how it occurs, the dynamics to go from one attractor to another is not random at all. It's, it's actually quite predictable. I mean, it follows a path which is predictable plus small fluctuation. So this is one of the things I want to explain you in this lecture. Why shall we expect this in a very complex dynamical system like this turbulent flow, S that rare events uh, the uh, uh, where events, time-wise, they are random processes. The only thing that you want to predict is the average time between two, two, two events. But from the point of view of how it occurs, this is predictable. And for this, I will, I mean, the main uh, explanation for these kinds of things is uh, large deviation theory and what I will call the Friding van Zell theory in, uh, in the following. 
okay so here what we so for for this example i have shown you before what we had want to compute is uh, the transition path so what we call the transition path uh, are this predictable path to go from one attractor to another we want to compute the transition rate the transition rate are j the rate here is just the inverse of the average of the time you have to wait in between two in between two events and so as you see this this uh, terminology transition path transition rate they are, they are the same terminology as the terminology of kinetic theory i mean the kinetic theory you learn about uh, in, in 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 chemistry or in thermodynamics in an undergraduate and so the reason why the terminology is the same is because the, the mathematical tools to study all these phenomena, I mean random transition in chemistry, random transition in biology, random transition in magnetic problems in statistical physics, random transition in uh, uh, any situation of uh, bistability in statistical physics, or the random transition in this turbulent flow, the mathematical tools are the same and they are, they are basically uh, 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 large deviation th theory. So this was an, an, an example of rare events. Uh, uh, the first example, rare transition between attractors. So another example is rare events that matter because they have a huge impact. So this example, I will not describe it again. So we th that was the subject of uh, my talk uh, uh, three weeks ago. So the example I was dealing with then was extreme heat waves and then I have shown you that we were able to compute uh, thousands or, or, or well hundreds or thousands more heat waves with a given uh, numerical cost than what would be done just by uh, running the, the model uh, without using a, a rare event algorithm. So let me skip th this part. So actually the, the uh, large deviation theory was introduced in turbulence long ago and I just want to, to go back to, to this uh, example. So it is related to intermittency in, uh, in three-dimensional turbulence. So this, this picture comes from a, a paper by Oman and Gra Grauer but it is a very classical picture of the dissipation rate in a, in a turbulent flow. So what you see here plotted, so you have a two-dimensional uh, cut of a three-dimensional uh, flow and the, 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 the pikes and the colors are related to the intensity of the dissipation. And so you see that in this domain the, the way the dissipation occurs is not at all homogeneous but it occurs through very localized and inhomogeneous spikes. And so this is what is called intermittency in the three-dimensional turbulence. And so in the classical theory of turbulence, during in the 70s ma mainly and in the 80s, I mean many people worked in characterizing the statistical property of intermittency in three-dimensional turbulence. And so one, one way to, to do that was to compute um, uh, this quantity. You, you look at the the difference in velocity at two different points. So this is delta v. Delta v parallel means that you are looking at the difference uh, for the component of the velocity along the vector in between the two points. And then you take this number to the power p and you look how it depends as a function of l. L is the distance between the, the two points. And so you take the average of, of, of uh, the statistics of this, and so there are scaling arguments uh, to, to say that this should go like L divided by L0 to the zeta p, where zeta p are called the uh, 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 structure function scaling argument. And so you this zeta p may depend on p. And so here you see uh, data from experiments or from numerics where you can see zeta p as a function of p. And so this characterized 
how the, the flow is actually the fact that this curve is not a straight line is related to the fact that the flow is not uh, uh, self uh, is not self si similar it is uh, there is a, a, f a, f a, f a generalization of the notion of self similarity which is related to the fractal structure of uh, the flow so in building uh, simple models of this during the 70s I mean s some uh, people uh, mainly the Russian school, school made a model which is called the random cascade model so it's a model for which you have a set of uh, 2 to the power n cube each of size L L is a uh, a size L0 multiplied by 2 to the power uh, minus n so basically you, you the, the size of the cube is divided by 2 each time and so then you make a, a, a hierarchical construction and you assume in a phenomenological way that the dissipation of each cube is given by this so you take epsilon which is the average uh, uh, dissipation rate and at each time you go to a to a cube at a smaller scale you multiply by a number omega uh, omega n and so the fact that you multiply this number at each time means that uh, phenomenologically it means that the dissipation will be partitioned in cubes according to random number that uh, that I uh, have picked uh, this way and so the random number here are just picked as uh, id random variables Uh, I identically uh, id uh, independent and identically distributed random variables so you, you take one distribution and each time you pick a random number from this same distribution and so the random numbers are picked independently and so then you, you want to look at the, the amounts of dissipation that occur in a cube at a, s at a scale L and so when you do that, you, 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 you just, because of this uh, random number multiplication, you just have to, you have to make a simple algebra, I won't go through. And so you find that the dissipation at the scale L is given by epsilon multiplied by L divided by L0 to a power. And this power can be computed as the sum of n random independent uh, variable so you and so when you and then you can ask what is the probability of the value of this xn and so this is one of the first examples of a large deviation theory when you compute the sum of identically distributed random variable and you look at the probability that xn is equal to x here you can there is a, uh, a simple theorem to prove that the probability that xn is equal to x goes like the exponential of minus n when n is large multiplied by a function s of x and so this function s of x is called a large deviation rate uh, function and so it is a it, it is a, a huge simplification here because you you have uh, something that dep was depending on two parameters n here the numbers of s of some you have made and x the, the the parameter for the probability and then it is characterized just by one function small s of uh, x So the the, um, the 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 aim was to have a, a phenomenological model of uh, 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 the, the structure function for three-dimensional turbulence. So what these people have done is to come with a very simple phenomenological model, where you have a, 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 a hierarchical structure where y at each size you build a new new cubes 
and you uh, uh, so it, it's a phenomenological picture of a Richardson uh, cascade and so when you do that and you when you want to do the, the, the mathematics of this and you want to compute the the uh, the, the exponents zeta q that uh, uh, corresponds to this model and then you, you it turns out that you have to make the sum of n independent random variable and so it's you then in order to compute this you have to compute this function s which is a large deviation uh, weight function and so I, I take this because this was uh, so this this has been the worked out by Mandelbrot in the 70s and this was the first use of a large deviation theory in, uh, in, in, in turbulence yes oh this is this is uh, this is just by definition of a phenomenological model. This is the definition of a, of a model here. Yeah. Yes? I, I can define multifractal with two sentences, but uh, so uh, I mean when you have uh, when you are computing this uh, exponent, how the statistical property of a system depends on on, on on scale. So you have when you have a, a simple fractal structure, you see that uh, the you have a self-similar structure. I mean the the, the statistics you get. Uh, are the same when you change uh, uh, w when you go down the scale for instance so for instance a, a, a typical picture is that you you are looking at uh, a Brownian motion or another things that uh, has a simple fractal structure and you take a picture at a given scale and then you take a picture at another scale and then you compare them and you, you realize that you cannot distinguish the statistical property once the two pictures have been properly rescaled. So this is a monofractal structure. So let, let me let me finish this explanation. And so uh, initially people were thinking that in turbulence uh, you should you, you may expect such a fractal structure for these kinds of problems. But what they realized that there was not such a simple self-similarity structure and it has been interpreted, I mean, uh, uh, by making a statistical model for which you would have more than one uh, uh, scaling exponent. So basically, locally, you, you have local value of exponent that, uh, that differs uh, in space. And so you can compute the statistics of the overall structure, something like a statistical sum of fractal structure with different exponents. And I, I, I cannot explain you why, but I mean the the uh, I mean the curvature here is related to what are called the 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 multifractality of of, uh, of the field. Uh, sorry uh, can I ask uh, just technical question. Epsilon depends on L and K what is L and K Epsilon LK is a product of L, L, L is the ah. L is the size okay so it L is directly related to N okay so it's the size of the cube you are looking yes, at yeah. and then at a different uh, size you have many cubes so K is uh, the index that I is uh, f uh uh, looking at w which cube you are looking at exactly is uh, identified by the value of k. Okay. Sorry, but I, I, I didn't want to go uh, to explain in detail this uh, multifractal model. I mean, the point was ju just to make that 
this was the first uh, use of uh, large deviation theory in, uh, in, in turbulence. This, is just, this was just an, an introductory slide. Okay, so let me give a, a more general definition of uh, la la large deviation theory. So large deviation theory, if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, it is a general framework to describe probability distributions in asymptotic limits. So for instance, you, you, you have a random variable x that depends on a small parameter epsilon. And so you look at the probability that x epsilon is equal to x. So it's a PDF that depends on an external parameter epsilon. So you have then, uh, then your PDF depends on two things, the, 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 the x, the value, and epsilon, the external parameter. And if you can prove that asymptotically when epsilon is small, the PDF behaves like uh, the exponential of minus f of x divided by epsilon, then you say that you have a, a large deviation principle and you call f of x the large deviation rate function and you call epsilon the large deviation rate. So this symbol here means that you are usually missing some prefactor here that asymptotically do not depend on, uh, on uh, epsilon. And the point is that there are lots of tools in order to get such result and when you get such a result it is a huge simplification because this function f of x will describe you uh, the most probable value for your PDF, it will describe you the typical fluctuation but it will also describe you the very rare fluctuation for your PDF. So the main thing here is that epsilon will be small and so because one over epsilon will be large and so the PDF will be strongly concentrated close to the minimum of f. So the point x where f reaches maximum will be the, the most probable value of your PDF and you will have a strong concentration there. And then you can expand f around this minimum and you get the Gaussian fluctuation uh, and so you get a Gaussian approximation. Or, you ca or if you don't expand f you can go further and, and, and get more information about the tail of uh, the distribution. So I, as I was telling before, when you study modern statistical mechanics, this large deviation theory is the key tool, and then you, you, you apply this to uh, a, a whole set of phenomena that are described by the same uh, uh, mathematics. And so for instance, in equilibrium statistical mechanics, F is, uh, will typically be the free energy of the entropy or uh, any of the, 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 uh, the thermodynamical potential and usually epsilon is kbt divided by n and so this limit here is related to, to the thermodynamic limit. And so this has been developed, I mean the, the mathematics and the theoretical physics has been developed mainly in the 70s by people like uh, Lanford, uh, Freiling, Wenzel, Varadon, those are the name of the mathematician but there are also many names in the phys physics community related to, 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 to this theory. No, no. I mean, uh, uh, the, the f the so the, the question is, uh, do you require to be in the equilibrium state to get s such a theory? So historic hist historically, it has been derived first for equilibrium statistical mechanics but uh, I mean during the last 20 or 30 years it has been used mainly for dynamical problems for uh, which are non-equilibrium and actually uh, with Antoine in the past we work on the equilibrium statistical mechanics of the mixing of the potential vorticity and I won't go through these slides, but we have a, a review with Antoine and for which we describe the most probable mixing of potential vorticity and for instance it, it led to a nice model of a great red spot of Jupiter 
And so this is an example of equilibrium statistical mechanics. But as you may guess, uh, this is very, I mean, to do this is has a very limited scope in uh, geophysical fluid dynamics because most of uh, most of the flow that we are studying are non-equilibrium flows. And so the point is really to go towards non-equilibrium flow. And so what I want to stress now is large deviation theory for dynamical systems, for which we don't need to make the hypothesis that we are, we are in, in, in equilibrium statistical mechanics. Well, how uh, smooth does the free energy function need to be? Are there any regularity conditions? So it, it usually, uh, so uh, so this is a very in in interesting question because you in in most for for most of the parameter regime, this function will be smooth. But for some regime, it will not be smooth, and so you will have cusp typically for this large deviation rate function, and then this becomes extremely interesting because this cusp are related to uh, bifurcation in uh, for dynamical systems, or they are related to phase transition in equilibrium statistical mechanics. So it's basically where your systems change dr drastically its behavior. So it's usually points in the parameter space which are extremely interesting to study because th that's where your systems ch change dr drastically its behavior. So it is a part. Uh, it is a whole part of the theory to study the the types of phase transition that you can get related to the the, the, the lack of the loss of uh, smoothness of uh, this uh, this function. So what I want to stress in the in this introduction is the tools that allows to compute this large deviation rate function for dynamical systems. And so I will I will try to go through uh, three different kinds of problems: dynamical systems with small noises, which is called friding van der theory. So you see that we will need a, sm uh, a, a, a small parameter. So in this first case, the small parameter will be the amplitude of the noise. Here I will assume that the amplitude of the noise is small, and then this will be my epsilon. Or I will describe large deviation for time integrated observable, which are called Donsger Varadon large deviation. And then we have another parameter, which is just the inverse of the time over which we average the, the statistics. Or I will also briefly describe the large deviation for the slow evolution of a dynamical system with two, t with two different time scales. So those are three examples for which we can compute large deviation for dynamical systems which are uh, non-equilibrium. So let me begin with the, the first case. Large deviation in the weak noise uh, regime. So in order to, to do that, I will describe uh, the simplest possible problems, which is called the, the Kramer's problem. So it is a pedagogical example for a bistability situation. And then I will try to explain you how this may be relevant or not uh, for, for turbulent flow, for instance. So here we have a very simple dynamics. So we have the, the, the dynamics of a particle with a position x. So x is a single variable, or it could be a vector. I mean, it is the position of the particle in one dimension, or in two dimension, or in any dimension. So the dynamics is just minus the gradient of, of v at the point x. So v is a potential function. So I can draw an example of a potential function for uh, a particle with one degree of freedom. So this would be v as a function of x. Or it could be in, a, in two dimensions. Then I, I could 
show the level line of V, I would have x1 and x2, then in with two degrees of freedom, and then I, I can plot the, the level lines of V, and I, I can assume, for instance, that you know I have uh, this kinds of st uh, structure for the for the, the level line where I have two local minimum, which will be two attractor for this dynamics because the, the particle will fall down the potential and then there is some somewhere here, some s somewhere here saddle point so I can call this attractor x0 this one x1 and the one and the saddle point in between xs so if if I just write th this dynamics so the d this dynamics is extremely simple you you start from anywhere and you just fall down the potential and so then after some time you reach one of these attractor x0 or x1 and that's it the, the dynamics end here but now what i will do is to add a small noise so eta of, of t is a, a noise which has a gaussian dynamics which is white in time but this is just as an for an for making an example, it could have any any statistics. So here I, ju I just assume that it is a, a white noise in time. Eta of t is the derivative of uh, uh, the Wiener process. And so because of this small noise, uh, then the dynamics will wa wander around the attractors. And from time to time, very rarely, the noise may lead you to jump up until the saddle points and then switch to the other attractor. So the phenomenology is very simple. So this is an example of a simulation for this, this uh, potential where you have x as a function of time. So here the time I be has been risqué by 1000, so it is a very long time. And so you see x is close to the attractor 1 for a very long time and then suddenly it switch close to the attractor minus one back and forth and you see the phenomenology is very similar to the one I was showing for this MHD experiment of the one that we would expect actually for random transition between between a complex flow and so then the basic question is uh, what is the statistics of this jump how long will you have to wait in between two jumps. So you just compute the length of this interval here, the length of that one, and so on and so forth, and you make the PDF. So tau here is the, the length of uh, an interval in between two jumps, and this is the PDF for tau. And so here there is a log scale, this is a linear scale and a log scale. And so you see that the PDF, which is uh, in red here, is very well approximated by a straight line in with this log scale so the PDF is exponential so with a very good uh, approximation the PDF of tau is just the exponential of minus tau divided by some average value of tau and so this is the sign statistically that two successive events, two successive jump, are decorrelated. And it's just like a Poisson process when you look at when this events occurs. Actually, you have two Poisson process, one for the forward transition and one for the backward transition. And then you see that the, the PDF is parameterized by a single number, which is just the average time you have to wait. And so this is what we want to compute the average time you, you have to wait. So what is called the rate here is just the inverse of the average time. Lambda, by definition, is just 1 over the average time. So Kramers were thinking of what's, hap what's happening in, in, uh, in uh, chemistry, in, 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 in kinetic chemistry. So in chemistry, when you were undergraduate, you have learned that uh, when you have uh, uh, metastable states, 
and you have to cross a potential barrier or a free energy barrier then you have what is called an Arrhenius law and so this is here the Arrhenius law I mean the rate itself goes like the exponential of minus delta V where delta V is the potential barrier divided by KBT where KB KBT is the noise amplitude here and so KBT in thermodynamics is also the, the temperature and in front of this you have a, a, a time scale which, which is called just 1 over tau here and so the, the question that Kramers addressed is I know this from thermodynamics this Arrhenius law can I show that this is true for this very simple model and so this is what I want to explain you now using large deviation theory we can very easily got back this Kramer's result using uh, large deviation theory so this makes a connection between the dynamics and the, the thermodynamics of this problem and next I want to convince you that for turbulence problems you can do exactly the same yes I, I will I will explain you, you, you this uh. so the question is can the theory predict also the prefactor and so I, I will explain you so if this goes, goes beyond large deviation theory but uh, it's, it's basically going next order in, uh, in perturbative expansion okay so David wanted me to make this computation on the blackboard so it's, it's, it's not so difficult it would require uh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes to go through these slides completely at the blackboard so I can do that uh, afterwards uh, uh, on the blackboard here if, if some people are interested but I guess it's not um, uh, it's relatively easy to, to, to get the, the main idea so what's happening is that uh, let's look at the this x as a function of t so we start from some initial condition x0 and then you have we have a random process and so we, we can have many realization of this process and so the, the point is to look at the probability for such a path and so we, we will look at path probability so it's, it's, it's just like a PDF but we don't look at the value at a single time but we look at the value at all time and so, so it's a joint PDF of the value at all time so this is what we call path probability and so this is a transition probability St if you know that you start at x0 what is the probability to end here at xt at time t so only part of the path will reach this value and the other will, will have some other value so you look at the, the probability that starting at x0 at time 0 you will end at xt at time t and so here you are we will make a sum over all possible paths this is the meaning of this uh, uh, dx and we will have to give to any path any possible path a weight and so the weight is given by this exponential of minus this action functional div divided by 2 k kbt so the the question here is what is this weight here that you should assign to a given path so it comes everything comes everything is related to the weight of the noise because if without the noise the, the, the dynamics would be deterministic and you would have a single path and so if you want to have another path you have to count on the effect of uh, the noise and so the, the point is that the, the probability to get eta for a white noise would be given would be proportional to the exponential 
of minus one half of the integral of zero of t of eta of t dt, eta square of t dt. This is the probability to observe uh, a, 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 a white noise, if you want. So this is what I could explain in uh, in ten minutes, uh, uh, more more precisely. But here you see that. Uh, it is something which is quadratic, which is related to the fact that the noise is Gaussian. It is something that involves a single integral, which is related to the, the fact it's delta correlated in time. And here you see that the statistics at any time is the same. And so the fact that you have this very simple quadratic integral in is related to the fact that we use a noise which is white in time. And so this is the probability for the noise. And then I have this equation. So the only thing I need to do is to make a change of variables. So this is the equation that relates x to eta. So I make I just make a change of variable here. And so eta of t is just 1 over square root of 2 epsilon multiplied by x dot plus dv over dx. This is the simple relation between eta and x. And so then if I plug this in here, I obtain just exponential of minus 1 over 4 epsilon, the integral of 0 to t, of x dot plus dv over dx square dt. And so this will be the probability to observe a path x. So there is a normalization factor in, 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 in front of it. So this is why here, when I make this integral over all possible paths, I have this exponential of minus a t divided by 2 k b t. So epsilon here is the same as, as, as k b t there. And so here I have uh, 1 over 2 epsilon, and I have another factor 1 over 2 here and this x dot plus dv over dx to the square. And so this explains you, thi this gives you a probability for a path for, for x. Is, is this clear? Uh, yeah. Um so as far as I understand, in the, the path integral, it's the, the exponential of uh, di this, this, this integral. Yeah. Uh, you, you wrote on the blackboard with the eta, e eta square. Yeah. Um, this is the probability of a single path okay. as a function of uh, a path x. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, just I, I, don't, uh, so I don't understand wh where does this come from. It, com it all comes from here. This is the probability of, the, uh, of a white noise. This is I have not explained, but I could explain on a blackboard how to, to get this formula. Oh, okay. I just uh, told you that it is consistent with the fact that it is Gaussian, delta correlated, and with an amplitude that doesn't depend on, 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 on time. So you, you look at, so in general you, you you have a, a stochastic process, so you have many paths that start from x, and you sa you ask what is the probability that I will observe a path that follow this line, let's say. So here you have observed one, t I mean, so it's the probability to be in a na neighborhood basically of uh, this path. Okay, so this is the question you, you, you ask. So is it the probability of having x or eta t or at the bottom? At the bottom, this is the probability of, of observing the path x. 
I want from the probability of eta to the probability of x by just making a change of variable using this, uh, this, this formula. Okay? So this explains this, uh, this formula. Then, then th there is a, a, a further. So usually, so th this formalism to write probability for path for uh, stochastic processes has been first devised by uh, Onzager and Macloop in the 1950. So this was just three years after uh, fi Feynman worked out the path integral formalism for quantum mechanics. So it's 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 very it's very s similar. S so usually people are not able to compute such uh, integral over sets of path with a co complex function, and so um, often the, the result that uh, that uh, w that we get are asymptotic result. And so this is what we will do now. So when we are when we make an integral of ex some of a function g of x multiply by uh, an exponential of minus another function f of x divided by epsilon dx. So this is, called this is what is called a, a Laplace integral. And then I want to look at the limit when epsilon goes to zero of uh, this integral. And so you see that here, as epsilon will be very small, this here in the exponential would be extremely large. And so it will completely dominate the computation of this integral. And so you can show that when epsilon is small here, this is dominated by exponential of minus f of uh, x minimum divided by epsilon, where x minimum is the, you look at the your function f, and you look at, so this is f, as a function of x, you look at where the maximum is located, and so it is completely dominated by the value of the maximum of f. And then you can prob you can also compute uh, what I will call a prefactor, and so here the prefactor is related to the value of g of x m, and there is also a factor that is related to the I, I won't write it here, but it's related to the second derivative of, of function f around here. I mean, to get this prefactor, you have to make a Gaussian approximation close to the minimum. So this is what is called a Laplace integral of the, the Laplace principle. So here, basically, we will do just the same. We have a very complex object to compute, but what we will do is just to compute it asymptotically when uh, kBT or epsilon is small. And then we have exactly this, st this structure here, that uh, uh, we integrate something with the exponential of minus uh, f divided by epsilon. And so the only thing that we need to do is to minimize then the function here. So the function here is this action. And so when we want to compute the transition probability to go from x0 at time 0 to xt at time t, it will be given, I mean, the by the exponential of the minimum of the action here with the boundary condition that x at time 0 it, it, it is x0 and x at time t is xt. And so I just have to compute the minimum of the, 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 the action functional here. And then this will give me that the transition probability will be given by the exponential of minus the minimum of this divided by 2 kBT. So if I do that for Kramer's problem, so you remember Kramer's problem was uh, just the case where dx over dt is minus dv over dx plus square root of uh, uh, 2 kBT eta. Then I got exactly the result of uh, the Arrhenius law. I mean, this result that you know from thermodynamics. And so the computation of the minimization 
of the action here is extremely simple it is uh, uh, when I teach this in lecture this is an exercise you can give uh, uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes and so you get uh, immediately the, the Arrhenius factor for the transition probability to go from one attractor to another yes so on the previous slide um could you go back on the previous slide please uh thank you um so th there is no integral in the last uh, in the last um, the last equation does this come from that uh, the the probability density function is highly peaked uh, around the yes. the the the, maxi the maximum probability yes it ju it's just the use of the laplace uh, principle you you are computing an integral and then you see that it is completely dominated by what's happening at the maximum or on the minimum uh, uh, sorry i didn't got that <laughs> thank you it's, it's, it's okay uh, and so here quick question S this is a simple integral the yes, Laplace. In, this in this case it is a simple integral just for the sake of the discussion but here it is an integral over path Okay. So, the so, it so here, what play the role of the minimum? Here, what was playing the role of a minimum w was a single value. There, what plays the role of a minimum is a path, actually. And so, my question is, because uh, um, I had the feeling that path integrals are weirdly defined somehow. So, is is it rigorously proven that this theorem holds for path integrals, or is it? I mean. So the. I mean, the physicists use the, the, the path integral formulation, which is easy to write and very heuristically, it, it is very simple. And you, you really get a picture s simple of what you are do doing. And so the mathematicians don't like that for uh, uh, deep uh, topological problems in functional space. And so they have developed uh, a different formalism. But basically, the result that the mathematician got with this rigorous formulation is exactly the same as the, the one you got using path integral. So path integral is the heuristic way to, to get things and uh, uh, there is a more proper way to do that uh, mathematics. And so as, as, you as uh, Alex stressed, here the minimum is a path. And so this is actually this what is plotted here. Here you are we have an example with two degrees of freedom, x1 and x2. And so the, the lines here are, are the level lines of the potential. And so you see one attractor here and one attractor there, and the saddle points in, in between. And so the red line is the, the minimum of the action. The, the, uh, not the minimum, the minimizer of the action, the path that minimizes the, the action. And so this is the path that helps us computing this, basically. And so the white line is one, re one realization of a transition from this attractor to that attractor there. So it is, it, it is a random process. And so you see that the path wanders around, but if you look at the path that actually goes to the other attractor, they are very close to the, 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 mini the minimum path. And so this, and actually the typical fluctuation around this minimum path are of order of square root of epsilon. And so then we got the explanation why even if uh, when it occurs is completely random, how it occurs should be predictable. I mean, what predicts how it occurs is the minimum of the action uh, that comes from this uh, large deviation theory. Okay? So I will skip uh, so this, I will skip this slide, but this, this slide is just to tell that here, I, for the sake of the simplicity, I was assuming a gradient dynamics, but I mean, it is valid for any dynamics. You don't need this gradient hypothesis. So it is valid also for non-equilibrium dynamics. So this, this was for the prefactor answer. I will skip this one too. So the question is, uh, 
so in principle now I have explained you why we expect uh, this transition path to be predictable I mean in, in principle if Friedling Manzel theory would be applied to turbulence dynamics we should be able to explain uh, the fact that the transition path here are predictable but the point is that when you look at the equation for instance I will show you the equation for a barotropic flow with stochastic forces the equation you write do not fit in the Friedling van uh, framework and so there is a missing uh, link between the uh, turbulent equation we write and Friedling van Zell theory and so this will be the subject of the, of, uh, the, the second part of, uh, of, of, of my talk so let me switch to, to this So we now we, we want to apply this to uh, rare transition between uh, at atmosphere jets and to see how it how it applies to that. So you already ga got the intro introductory slides. It's the Jupiter example for which such a transition occurred in the past, and the question is what would be the probability for this to occur again in the future uh, uh, how to compute this so this is the same as what I just explained so we'll switch to the, the barotropic quasi geostrophic equation So the reason why we use this model it is because it is the simplest model for geostrophic turbulence. So it is the it describes a barotropic flow. So you, you know the model it has been dis used uh, in several uh, several times during the school. I mean uh, uh, Bill had a full lecture about this model uh, last week. I mean Laura or, or other people have, have talked about the dynamics of these models too. So here it's a, it's a case which is very simplified. So the, the Q here is the potential vorticity. It's just omega plus beta y. Uh, we are on, on a beta plane with doubly periodic boundary condition. Um, there is a linear friction which uh, on Jupiter may, may mimic the, the radiative effect so it is a roof model for Jupiter it is a model without uh, the, the baroque unicity so without the, the transport of energy due to bar baroque unique effect but still again it is the simplest model that will produce this banded structure with, uh, with jet and so here we, we add a stochastic force and so what uh, the, the property of this stochastic force is uh, that uh, it is uh, delta correlated in time and it has a, a, a correlation function here which is smooth in space so epsilon is the energy injection rate by this uh, stochastic force here so this force is here to mimic the effect of, uh, of of uh, convection or baroclinic effects so basically you, you expect so here it's very natural to have a white in times force because we are looking at the evolution of jets on time scale which are huge compared to the time scale of the baroclinic instability and so this is a very natural limit and then what is observed on Jupiter is that we, we, we observe uh, vortices that are created at the scales of about uh, Rosby deformation radius which is rather small compared to the domain size so this is what would uh, describe what would fix C here in a model like this so C here is a uh, the correlation scale for the forcing is at a scale which is somehow smaller than the, the scale of the jet 
So this is a reasonable model for Jupiter uh, zonal jet at uh, at uh, li leading order. So reason this way, we have four parameters: epsilon, the energy ejection rate, lambda, beta, and L, the size of the of the box. So I I don't talk about the dissipation here, which is there ju uh, mainly for numerical purpose, and it doesn't affect much the large-scale uh, dynamics. So there are two independent non-dimensional parameters, because we can choose the, the spatial scale unit, such that L is 2 pi, and we can choose the temporal scale unit, too. So from these four parameters, there are only two, two independent non-dimensional parameters left. So in order to choose the time scale, I just look at the energy balance. So the energy balance is very simple in this case. The, the, the average of the energy, the way it evolves with time, is given by you, you just have the, the linear friction effect. You have the effect of the energy dissipation by this uh, small scale dissipation mechanism, but it will be negligible. And you have the energy injection rate. So this is a huge simplification of this model. The, f the fact that you force by a stochastic force, uh, you, you know in advance the energy injection rate in a, in a model. So in more interesting models for which the force is uh, deterministic, usually you don't know in advance the energy injection rate, and it makes things more tricky to, to, to evaluate from, from the beginning. I was wondering, how do you define your energy here as a function of V, etc.? In this model, the energy is just the kinetic energy. Okay. And it's a coincidence that you use the same symbol then for the expectancy of, of stochastic variables. So the energy is E like this. Oh. The expectancy is uh, okay, okay. <laughs> this uh, E li like that. And, and Z is entropy? Z is uh, just the, the, the entropy. So when you look at the, the balance here by neglecting this, and you, you, you wait for your, your model to, to spin up, so you, you, you reach a statistically stationary state for which the energy is just epsilon divided by, by 2 lambda. So basically you know in advance the energy, so you know in advance the typical uh, velocity of a jet, and so on and so forth. And so I, I will just work with a, a time scale such that this number, the energy, is of order 1. So it just means that I have chosen the time scale, which is the, the jet time scale, the, the turnover time for the jet. The turnover time for the jet is 1 here. So when I do that, and when I change the, the time units, I, I, I use primes, and then I, I forgot about the primes, I, 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 I got the model this way. So I have two parameters left, then. Alpha here, which is wi alpha will be the inverse of the spin up time for the model or the spin down time of the model, but it is also related to the injection rate when I use these non dimensional units. And I have a beta here, which is now beta prime, which has been rescaled through this uh, change of time scale and, and sp spatial scales. So this is the, the, the expression of alpha as a function of the physical parameter, and this is the function of the non-dimensional beta. And so you can easily see that the non-dimensional beta is just the ratio of L, the domain of the box, divided by the what is called the Rhine scale, the same one as was defined by uh, Bill Jung last week. And so we will see that this non-dimensional beta, this beta prime, will more or less fix the number of jets. I mean, the number of jets is given, the width of the jets will be given by the Rhine scale, and so the number of jets will be more or less the square root of beta. Yeah. And alpha doesn't matter, when alpha is small enough, it doesn't matter for the number of jets and the for the overall structure of the jet, but it, it, is, it compares how inertial is the model or how non inertial it is. I mean, when alpha is small, the model will be dominated by the inertial part, and when alpha is large, the model will be dominated by the dissipative part. 
And so here we will be interested mainly in the limit when alpha is small, and which is relevant for, 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 for Jupiter. And so this is how uh, the dynamics looks like. It is a very simple dynamics. So this is a, a work in a collaboration with uh, Eric, Eric Simonet. And so what you can see here is, uh, again, it's a doubly periodic domain. You see the vorticity field. And so you, you see these uh, small vortices. So the smaller vortices are at the scale of the forcing here. So you see the forcing scale, it is about uh, uh, if I use a Fourier transform of, of my spectrum here, the we are forcing w s with k between 12 and 15, maybe, or something like that. So this is the scale of the smaller vortices. But you see that same sign vortices seems to coalesce in bands. So the uh, and they form this uh, banded structure. And so you see that the, the system doesn't break the, the zonal symmetry. And so we are computing zonal average. And so this is a of Muller diagram of the zonal average here. This is time and a zonal average of the vorticity. And so you see that this the bands here are very stationary. So this is the as this evolved with time. So the, the red line is the vorticity. And so you see that the, the it's there is a slope here which is related to beta which is related to uh, potential vorticity. The potential vorticity tends to become more or less uniform in these bands. And so for the vorticity itself, it means that it is related to beta y. So this is what you see here. And then you have jumps, uniform and jumps, uniform and jumps. So this is like this at leaning over. And the green curve is the just the velocity profile. And so here we have produced two jets, two, two eastward jets, and two westward jets. Two eastward jets and two, two westward jets. So this is very classical. It has been studied by uh, hundreds of uh, uh, people in, in the past. And so when you tune beta, you tune the, the numbers of jets. So for beta equal 5, square root of beta is about 2, you get 2 jets. For beta equal 10, square root of beta is about 3, you have 3 jets, and so on and so forth. And so you can more or less explain this way the, the, the jet structure of Jupiter. On Jupiter, the beta, of course, depends on the latitude, and then the spacing of the jet depends on the latitude, and it truthfully explains the spacing of the jet on, on Jupiter at leading at leading over. So the key point that we I want to stress here is that well if we tune beta somewhere in between this value and that value there should be a transition and this transition sh should be a discontinuous transition between because it will not break the symmetry. Yes. So in Jupiter this works uh, to explain the 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 jet spacing uh this argument because there is also the forcing that could uh, change or is it a secondary effect? Uh? Do you know, Jeff? Right. So, so th these jets are barotropic ones, so yeah, they, c they could be deep one or, yeah. or not. I mean, I mean, uh, I, I mean, it's really a toy model, right? I don't want to claim that this is. So, if we w compare the velocity profile, so you see this uh, here, we get cusp here, and the, the jet are rounded there, and so you, if you look at the jet at mid latitude on Jupiter, they have exactly this velocity profile. So there are strong analogies, whether they are the same or not. I, I don't want to push too much in. in, in this direction and certainly in this model there is you know there, there is not the energy flux from the equator to the poles uh, which is requested on Jupiter on Jupiter you have uh, internal energy source but you also have uh, energy source that comes from differential heatings and both play a role both uh, are of the same order of magnitude in terms of uh, power so here we have only one of these mechanism it just uh, Maybe it's not worth trying to go beyond an analogy here. 
sorry. This one. Uh, I think it's 5.26, if I remember well, but I may be wrong. So here you can see beta value 5, 10, 12.5. So I, I, as, I, I, as I was telling, we expect now uh, an abrupt transition when we go from 5 to 10 somewhere. And uh, there should be an hysteresis behavior because at, uh, for some value, we expect to have multiple equilibria. So the fact that there may be multiple equilibria was also st stressed by Petros, but uh, it, it was stressed in, in, the, in the framework of a quasi-linear theory, and they were not studying the, the, the dynamics of the transition from one attractor to, to another. So this is what we have done with Eric. So you, you, see, you, see, you see here a value of beta, which is intermediate, and you see random transition from two jets to three jets. So here you see two jets, three jets, uh, two jets again, three jets, and so on and so forth. And so the time scale here are huge. So you see alpha here is about 10, 10 to the minus three. So when alpha t is 3,500, it means that we have millions of turnover times of the systems. So it's a huge time scale compared to what people uh, usually compute. And then in order to better see the transition, we have computed this uh, uh, black and gray plots here. So the, the, the red one is the Fourier transform of the zonal average with wave number two. And so basically Q2 is large when we have two jets. And Q3 is the Fourier transform of the field with wave number three. So Q3 is large when you have three jets. So it is an order parameter just to, to monitor whether we have two or three jets. And so you see the transition from two to three, two, three, and so on and so forth. And so there are, there are very clear transitions that occur on a, an extremely long time scale. And so the question are the same as the one for the theory before. Can we compute the transition path? And can we compute the transition rate? And so the method I want to show you here is a purely numerical method. We don't rely on the theory, on the Friedman mansell theory. But with this purely numerical method, we'll try to check the outcome of the Friedman mansell uh, theory. And so we use an algorithm which is specifically dedicated to compute rare event which is called adaptive multilevel splitting algorithm. So it, it has the same spirit as the algorithm I was describing uh, three weeks ago for the heat wave problem, but it is different. So let me explain it very briefly. So we start from a, an attractor A and we want to go to an attractor B. So we run an ensemble of uh, simulation. So here we have three simulation on this sketch, but usually it's about uh, 100 simulation typically, a few hundred simulation. And then we compute a function Q, which we call the reaction coordinates, which tell us how far we want in the direction going towards B. So you see here that the third trajectory was the best, the trajectory two was the, the second, and the trajectory one was the worst. And so we will, we will uh, forget the worst one, and we will replace it by another one, and so the purple one. And the purple one has been built using an initial condition from one of the others. So here it has been built using an initial condition from the trajectory two. So basically we take the same level line, we take the initial condition of the trajectory two at that point, and we, re we, we run a new trajectory starting from here with a new realization of the noise. So we get a new realization. And so you see that now the purple trajectory by construction is better than the trajectory one that has been cancelled. So our ensemble is better the second time. And so we will run this uh, k time until we actually have 
this androids of trajectory making the transition from one attractor to another. So each time we do this selection procedure, we select n minus one trajectory among n. And so the probability which is related to that is n minus one over n or one minus one over n. And so we will do this k time. And so we get an estimate of the probability for the transition from one attractor to, to another through this formula. And so this is a way to get thousands of transition without having to wait uh, such a long time and to estimate the transition probability from one attractor to one over. Yes? Oh, we, we didn't. St we, we we started close. To w w the question wha was why did we start at Q1 value? So no, we were starting close to the attractor A, and then Q1 was the value, the maximum which that by the trajectory one. And so let me show you one of these transitions we got this way. And so you see that uh, usually the the, the the vortices, the blue vortices cannot coalesce here in this area. They will be sheared apart, they will be transported. The system doesn't like that. And it will be it, it, it's really unprobable to have this happening. But still it will happen here. So I, I will go a bit faster. And so you see that some, some blue vortices begin to coalesce here, while it is very unlikely that this happens. It's a bit like a nucleation process in a, in a, in condensed matter. I mean, you you have to to go beyond the threshold in terms of probability to form the core of a bubble, and once the bubble is large enough, then it becomes stable and then it grows. So here it's exactly the same. You don't want to to produce a new jet here. It's unlikely the the this coalescence of vortices would be unstable, but very. But it can happen. It's very unlikely. And when it happens, it will produce a new band. And so you see that here on the, the velocity profile, that the new jet is uh, is growing slowly. And so this occurs on a time scale which is one over alpha. So here it's about a thousandth of turnover times of the systems. Yes. If you go back to the previous slide, where would that uh, trajectory you just computed fit onto the cartoon? How do you really... So at, at, at some points, I mean, we, we push more and more of this trajectory, and at some points they just uh, go through the saddle points and then they go down. Uh, and so when we have made the, this algorithm a number of times which is large enough, the trajectory actually make the transition that was very unlikely. And so for the movie we, we've seen, the it's starting point, th so it's oh one realization. The movie is just one realization starting somewhere here and ending at there. So it's just one trajectory. And we got thousands of uh, trajectories like, uh, like this. Can I, can I also ask a question? And this uh, calligraphic Q here is just a metric, it's for example, the Fourier component three minus Fourier component two, something like that. Yes, it's not. Yes, it's something like that. Yeah. Okay. It's not. not no. If you take this toy model seriously for Jupiter, yeah. How long would it take in dimensional terms for the jets on Jupiter to split? I will answer you just after. Uh, after because I I, I I I will have a plot for the. So. I have just two minutes to, to finish, so I, I, I just show you Q2 square as a function of Q2 Q3 square. And uh, so when Q2 is large here, you have two jets. When Q3 is large here, you have three jets. And what are these blobs? I mean, inside these blobs, you have 80% uh, uh, of the, the, the transition trajectory inside these blobs. And so it shows you that the actual dynamics of the transition uh, uh, is concentrated close to a single path, just like in the phenomenology of uh, the Freiling-Manzel theory I was explaining uh, you, you before. 
And so this is a, uh, this is a way, this is what we call atmosphere jet instanton. Instanton are, are this minimum of the action uh, we were describing descri in the Freiling Manzel uh, theory. So we have other kinds of transition. So go for example, going for from four jets. And so what we wanted is to actually compute, to answer the Joff question, is to compute the the mean, uh, the, the average of the time we have to wait in between two transitions. And so here we have a function as a function of alpha, the parameter, and it's. We have not been able to check that it is an arrange slow yet. We don't have a realization which is good enough. But it's a good idea to think that this time scale which increase exponentially when you, you when you decrease alpha. And so here we, we we have time scale of order of millions of turnover times or tens of millions of turnover times and so on and so forth. So it's very sensible to the value of alpha. So it depends really on the value of alpha you would take for, for Jupiter. And so because it is so sensible, I think it would not be a good idea to try to make a, a precise prediction for, for Jupiter with such a, a, a naive model. But basically, uh, what matters is the ratio of the, time scale, the initial time scale and the dissipative time scale. Okay, so I will stop uh, here. Just a question from just different perspectives. So, what are the energy constraints when you switch from two jets to three jets or three jets to two jets? So, I'm assuming that when you switch from three to two jets, you're just kind of increasing kinetic energy, total kinetic energy in the jets. So, where does that supply come from? No, the, the, the there is very little fluctuation of energy. Oh, I mean, right. the, the energy fluctuates mm -hmm. always. But you don't see anything uh, specific about the, the, the energy. There is a bit more when you are looking at the anstrophy. So the, because it, uh, this happens on time scale, which are very long to compare to the time scale you need to reach the energy balance state. The energy balance state is achieved on time scale of order uh, one over alpha here. I guess the key to this algorithm is this quantity capital Q. Yes. And there was one question about it, and it still it seems like you're, it's like the dominant Fourier mode of your jets in this case. But in general, how do you define that? I mean, it's here you, you have a pretty symmetric situation, and you have this rather simple number of jets that you can, it seems like in general you have a hard time defining that. Yes. How close you are to some attractor. So the so the Q is in I mean the Q is indeed the crucial point from a practical point of view. If you had a good Q, I mean uh, the, the the algorithm we use perform extremely well and it's impressive how useful it is. If you don't have a good Q, if you try to push your models in the wrong direction, then it's it's completely hopeless. It's actually worse than doing nothing. And so it's critical to have an idea of the phenomenology of the transition you expect. So you, you need, uh, you need a, a phenomenological understanding of what you expect to happen for the transition to occur. So, you, so for instance, you guess that for the transition, so for instance, you guess that uh, if uh, something may, uh, so this is a case by case uh, discussion at a phenomenological level to guess a good cue and then to use this algorithm to test that it will lead to a transition. Yeah. Could you please come back to the slides with the dimensionless parameters? I find those important. Thank you. So I'm trying to make the connection with what Bill Young told us. So I think he was interested in the limit of, of L going to infinity. So that's probably infinite alpha and beta prime with the ratio alpha squared over beta prime, which yes, was the anostrophy. I, I, I should have made my, this, this connection myself. Thanks for asking that. So uh, Bill was using the zonostrophic parameter. 
the limit alpha goes to zero here I am studying is related to the limit when the zonostrophy parameter goes to to, in to infinity so it was the inertial limit he was considering so the, the zonostrophy limit I is something like the power one fifth well the power one fifth of the zonostrophy parameter is related to alpha but it also involves the, the other non-dimensional parameter so we find this way much more natural because you know here we have a parameter that the two non-dimensional parameters are the ratio of, of the size to the wine scale which is very important in this problem on one hand and the other non-dimensional parameter just compare two time scales yeah. so it's very simple but but the first thing he was doing was letting l go to infinity with other parameters fixed i mean this i mean we can go we can take l going to infinity i mean it's a, i mean you, you have to describe this in terms of non-dimensional parameter if you ch change one parameter how this affects the non-dimensional parameter and the main uh, non-dimensional parameter bill was using was the zonostrophy parameter which is closely related to alpha okay it's time for lunch now we can thank Froggy again